Uh, I'm Dan Alexander. I'm from the Northeast Kansas Library System. We haven't met before, but from looking at most of these names, uh, I think we've crossed paths maybe one or two times, maybe a lot more than that. So I will go ahead and mute myself and just welcome our state librarian, Ray Walling. Thanks a lot for being here, Ray. People are excited to hear from you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so I'm just going to start with an introduction. My name is Ray Walling. I am the state librarian of Kansas. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I earned my master's degree from University of Michigan. And while I was there, I worked in the law library for a period of time doing processing, and then eventually moved over to the Government Documents Center that managed their federal and state government documents. Uh, but as an internship originally, and then as a um, assistantship for the remainder of time I was at Michigan. Uh, after completing my degree, I was uh, offered a position at Baker University. So I worked there for 14 years, seven years as the electronic services and government documents librarian, and seven years as the director. Uh, but as many of you know that work in smaller libraries, um, you kind of take on a lot of responsibilities other than what your job says. So I did reference and instruction and interlibrary loan assistance and all sorts of other things uh, that gave me a wide understanding of how libraries operate. Um, during my time in Kansas, I have been active in the Kansas Library Association, serving uh, in leadership roles, including as chair of the Government Documents Roundtable, the private academic library section, and the college and university library section. And currently, at least for the last almost four years now, I've been the president of the Kansas Library Association Educational Foundation Board. Um, before I became state librarian, I served on the board of the state library for six years. And um, then I applied for this position and have been in position for about a year and a half. So that's kind of my brief introduction. Great, thanks for that. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. So next, which I think is great for us to be able to talk about is um, what do state libraries do and why? So there's a, state, a saying among state librarians that if you've seen one state library, you've seen one state library. Uh, because every state library operates differently. We have different priorities. Some state libraries have their state historical society or their archives in the state library. Some provide access like we do to reference services to the legislative staff and the executive staff, while others don't do that, have a separate library and separate unit altogether does that. But I think what helps to explain what we do in Kansas is to look back at the history and kind of how we developed over time. So I'm going to kind of keep this short. Um, so I'm going to miss some points here as I go along. But essentially, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 that set up the territory of Kansas included a section that, A, gave money to the territory to set up buildings for the uh, government for the new territory, but then in the same clause, set up money for a library to be purchased and to provide it to that, um, to the governor, to the legislative assembly, to judges of the Supreme Court, et cetera. Um, so that's really the founding was actually in the Kansas Nebraska Act of the territorial library that then became the state library. Um, and obviously when they met in the territorial time period, um, they built on that through uh, different state or territory laws and regulations and that kind of thing. Um, but the whole point of that was originally essentially the reference division that supported the needs of the three branches of government. And that's where our reference services division began. Over time, some additional responsibilities were added. For instance, in 1976, there was a uh, depository service that was added that spread information to libraries and other entities around the state so people could look at what the government was doing. Um, that over time, became the Kansas Government Information Online Library that we have today. We still do have a tangible depository program, but it's very limited in what is sent out at this point. Additionally, there was interest kind of in the same vein of getting information out there and helping people understand what was going on in state government of having someone answer questions of people in Kansas about the legislature and the executive branch. And that's where that legislative hotline and the legislative uh, email service and chat service, all those kind of came from that desire. So that's kind of one division. Then in 1899, we had the Traveling Libraries Commission that was formed. And the year before that, they had the Kansas Federation of Women's Clubs 
um, basically set up these traveling libraries that were um, set up throughout the state. And it worked so well, they went to the legislature and asked for it to be funded by the state government. And they did. At the time, that was put under the state librarian's responsibilities to chair a committee that oversaw that program. So initially it started out with the idea of extending library services where they didn't exist through like collections of 50 books being distributed here and there throughout the state. Over time, um, that, that commission was able to distribute federal funds that were allocated for library services, set up service centers around the state and support the continuing education needs of librarians around the state. So if you think about what the regional systems do and some of the things the state library does today, when the Traveling Libraries Commission went away in the 60s, both the regional systems were created that same decade and the state library had its kind of restructuring at that point. And they kind of split those responsibilities up um, based on changes in how libraries operated in the 60s, well, even before that. But at that point, what would be the most beneficial structure for supporting the libraries around the state? So that was kind of the initial, um, I would say, beginning of well, state, not state aid, but federal money being distributed to libraries. So we saw that through the LSCA Act and now the LSTA Act, um, as well as um, obviously the other services that the systems and the state library provide. Uh, in the 70s, there was a regional library for the blind and physically handicapped that was developed. Eventually, that became part of the state library's responsibilities and now is the talking books service that we have in Emporia State. Uh, in the 80s, we had the Interlibrary Cooperation and Resource Sharing Act that was passed. Initially, that started as grants to help support interlibrary loan and other services. And over time, there was development of statewide services, um, databases, obviously, over time that we now have, um, especially when CanEd went away. Um, one of the things that was kept uh, when Canada went away was money for the statewide database purchases. So that money was transferred from the Board of Regents to the State Library in order to continue that service moving forward. And then some other things that just have randomly kind of been assigned to us, although they make sense. For example, the Center for the Book, um, that's a decision I think the governor makes. So at some point the governor said, okay, the State Library is going to be in charge of the Center for the Book. So that was added to our responsibilities as well. But through that history, you hopefully can see like the reference division from the earliest time was developed, the idea of interlibrary cooperation resource sharing the beginning of kind of statewide services. And then that uh, regional library for the blind and physically handicapped is the beginning of the talking book service. I love that bookmobile. And I recognize the talking books there uh, booth. We did take a visit there before in Emporia. Um, so yeah, I think it's really be interesting. I'm glad you're willing to talk about this next question. How is the state librarian chosen in Kansas and uh, who oversees you over there? So the state library is a non-cabinet agency within the executive branch reporting to the governor. Um, so we're bound by the executive orders, um, the administrative regulations and directives and processes that the other executive branch agencies are required to follow. Um, as far as the process goes for selecting the state librarian, that is left up to the governor. And depending on who's in that role, the process has changed for each state librarian, I think, because we have different governors usually at those times when we got new state librarians. But um, basically it starts off with the normal, here's the resume cover letter, normal thing you would do. And then you get into a variety of forms. So I filled out two questionnaires. The second one was like 43 questions, a tax clearance form, a substantial interest ethics form. After all that was reviewed, then there was two rounds of interviews. And then the most interesting part, at least for me, uh, was the background check that is done by the Kansas Bureau of Investigations. So you used to submit another form that's about 30 pages for that. And it has all the questions like, do you, have you ever been in trouble with the law? Have you give gambling problems, drug problems, alcohol problems, but then also looking at your job history, your organizational involvement history, your housing, your education, your work history, and all of those three, or those multiple things I just listed, you have to have references and supervisors and pretty much for every single thing. Uh, so it's a pretty extensive list. I mean, going back to who is somebody that can speak to you about what you were like in high school? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. And then also like housing, going back 15 years, who was your landlord and somebody that knew you while you were in that property? So it's pretty extensive. And then on top of that, once you turn the form in, then they, they have to 
fingerprint you, so they do a criminal uh, check on you, and then a investigation where they actually go to the town that you're in and basically walk around and interview people about you. I think that was my favorite experience was I was working in the library the day they were doing that, and they came into the library, to the front circulation desk where a freshman student worker was, and pulled out their badge and said, I'm from the KBI, I need to speak to somebody about Ray Walling. <laughs> um, my freshman student worker was a little off guard by that. <laughs> Uh, and then my staff is a little confused because our policies say if law enforcement comes in, bring them to the director. And that wasn't going to work in that case. Um, so it's an interesting process. And then they interview you. So I got to be interviewed in my apartment, which was weird. Um, and from there, then the governor makes a final decision and announces the appointment as an interim kind of position until it's confirmed by the Senate. So then you go through a confirmation process through the Senate where you meet with the different senators that are on the committee, then they have a formal uh, confirmation uh, hearing. And then when the Senate came back into session in January, they they've officially confirmed my appointment. The other thing I can add on is, so in regards to whoever sees us and that kind of thing, we're, since we're a state agency, we go through the normal state budget process that happens every single year, as you see on that little flow chart there. Um, so there's hearings involved in that where they review our budget, ask us questions, the legislature, the governor makes a decision before that of what we're actually funded or what's, what she's going to recommend to the legislature. And then the legislature does the hearings, decides what agencies are going to be funded, and then we go from there. The other piece of the oversight is we do have a, a board uh, that's comprised, I think, of 14 people, mostly librarians. And they have a variety of roles in statute from advising me on policy and management issues um, to basically advocating for library services and thinking about how we improve interlibrary uh, cooperation and resource sharing across the state. Well, it seems like a very thorough hiring process. What was the timeline of how many months did that cover them between um, you starting? Uh... Yeah, so I applied right after KLA, so that was around Halloween, and my appointment was announced right before Memorial Day. Okay. All right, let's keep moving. Um, so earlier this year, libraries were surveyed regarding state aid funding, and we were wondering if you could tell us anything about the findings from these surveys, and um, how is that data used? Sure. So according to statute, the state librarian is responsible as part of the budget process to submit an amount of money that's needed for state aid. And that's based on two aspects. One, what libraries request, and the second, what's reasonably available. If you've been paying attention to a lot of press releases recently, there's been a surplus in the budget uh, for several months. Um, so the reasonably available isn't the issue at the moment. The issue is, well, what do we need? And that's where the two surveys came into play, the public library survey question and the follow-up survey question our survey, I should say. So through those two surveys, we saw a very similar trend for both surveys. First of all, libraries um, that were gateway linking and service center ones had a much higher request per capita than their other the other service levels. But then at the service level two, service center two, major service center one, major service center two, they all kind of were around the same amount per capita, which was kind of interesting. So what I ended up doing is proposing that a base amount of $3,000 per library be implemented that would require a technical change to the statute. Uh, so we'll see how that is received. And then on top of that, increasing the per capita amount to 67 cents per capita. Um, so I think right now it's at 28 cents or so. So those are the two components, but then we have to remember that state aid, according to statute, two thirds of it goes to the libraries and one third of it goes to the regional system. So in order to make that happen, I had to apply the other third to both components, which is what you kind of see in that table there. So that's kind of what I've proposed, but as you saw on that chart, it's a long process. We haven't heard back from the governor's office, haven't heard back obviously from the legislature, but I think right now is the time that we need to move forward and ask for what we need. And I appreciate everyone's time in answering that question and thought process that they put into answering that question. Absolutely. Thanks for filling us in on that process. Um, all right. So next we were going to talk about partnerships and that's maybe a little bit different for you at the state library level. What does that look like? And, um, and also if you could talk about why it's still important for an organization like your, your own. 
Yeah, I would say communication uh, and partnership are just vital to what we do in every single division of the state library. So for instance, we've had long going relationships with like audio reader. Um, we, ha we have services that we get through the department administration and have obviously connection with the governor's office, but we've been focusing on ways that we can improve and build on those relations. Um, so in our strategic plan, we talked about increasing our work with re audio reader in the department administration. Um, since we work with the office of personnel services, We've been able to get into the meetings and talk about the state library to the HR people across all of the non-cabinet agencies. And eventually, um, probably in the next month or two, I'm hoping to get into the cabinet agents or non-cabinet agency head meeting and speak about the state library to them. So kind of raising awareness among the state entities, um, not just for their knowledge and for state purposes, but just so they're aware of the kind of services we provide and can share them out. It's been interesting uh, with the Kansas Board of Regents, um, I made a connection with one of their staff members at the Office of Broadband Developments Conference last January. And we've been talking about, well, how do we get state library resources into that program. And fortunately for us, uh, a lot of the programs are headquartered in the community and technical schools in the state. So we already have a library connection with those programs. It's just giving the information out there about learning express resources and universal class resources and those kinds of things. So kind of building on those relationships and those opportunities, I've tried to build a relationship with the Office of Broadband Development, sending out their emails. Uh, they've recognized the important role that libraries play in the information landscape and not just what we do, but also the, our ability to get information out there and to improve our broadband access across the state. Um, so A, they're working on the deployment of that service at the moment, but they're gonna be shifting to talking about, well, how do we provide the user services to help people utilize this broadband access they're going to have? And I think libraries can play a vital role in that we've already done that to a certain extent. Um, so that is kind of, another example of what we want to do. And then tomorrow, I'm actually going to be going to a few libraries in the Kansas City area uh, with the Missouri State Librarian. And um, building those relationships among state libraries regionally, I think is also important in utilizing our joint efforts to advocate for things that we want at the federal level, but then also look at what's being what's happening policy wise and other issues that come up in the library environment and how do we responding and sharing that with each other so we can think about how we're going to respond to those situations individually. Ray, uh, I was curious, and it looks a lot different, I think, in other parts of the state besides where you and I are similar in Northeast, but what what, what is kind of the temperature people's feelings about broadband in Kansas right now? Um, are people optimistic about uh, getting increases in speed or that's what I feel like I've seen around here. Yeah, I think they are. The, the Office of Broadband Development has done an extensive um, tour of the state and even in some public libraries, they've held listening sessions across the state to say, here's what we're working on. What do you think? Um, I think there's definitely interest in it and, and what's going on. And there's a very strong team of people that are working on that project. So I'm very encouraged by the direction it's going. And we had a question in chat and it was just if you could kind of talk a little bit about uh, the audio reader group and, and how that's different than the state agencies talking books. Yes, I don't have a lot of knowledge about the audio reader program myself, um, but what I can say is we do contract with them to do some recording for us. And we've talked about ways we can work together to get volunteers and other um, support um, to improve uh, improve what access we have for those services so i can follow up with barbara afterwards sure. uh, after i talked with michael but they are that one would be a part of the state library which would be talking books and then audio reader is a as a standalone organization correct right? yeah we're not officially associated with each other in any way other than we do have a contract for um, providing certain services that we help we help fund great but a very limited contract i should say it's not like a large amount of money gotcha uh, okay. Um, well, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot more questions about that topic. Um, so we pretty much have uh, 10 minutes left to talk about exciting projects. So if you could just tell us what's going on, what's what's on the horizons for you at the State Library that you're working on. 
Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting things going on internally that we're working on. And I think to help realize why that is, we have to talk about a couple of things. First of all, we had the LSTA five-year review and five-year plan that we submitted, right? Kind of, well, the plan came out before I started State Librarian. Sorry, the review happened right before I was State Librarian. The plan I actually signed one of my first weeks as a State Librarian. Um, but basically, the information we found from that review helped guide us and think about what are some of the changes we need to make as an agency. Additionally, the State Library strategic plan um, needed to be reviewed and updated. So we went through a process of doing that involving staff and other stakeholder input, as well as our board's input to help determine what's our path look like for the next few years. So once those two kind of the review process and the strategic plan process were in place, that helped us think about well, what are some changes that we need to make uh, internally. Uh, we've had, we're very fortunate and very sad in a way, um, fortunate to have some wonderful colleagues that have been retiring over the last year, um, but have done amazing things for the State Library. But at the same time, we have some great new leaders that are taking over roles in the State Library. So it off, the combination of all those things happening at once offer an opportunity to think about how we allocate staffing resources and how we can kind of improve what we're doing and offer some new resources. So. Some examples of that would be we did add a communications coordinator position um, and we've been working on a variety of means of communication spending more time doing some proclamations, news releases. Uh, we did an advertising campaign for the uh, legislative hotline last legislative, legislative session and we saw a 37% increase in questions we received during that campaign over the previous uh, legislation, legislative session. So that was exciting. So. We're trying to do a lot more communication. That came from our LSTA five-year plan of that. A lot of feedback we received was you need to be communicating more about the services and the resources you have. Um, so we're working on that. Additionally, uh, based on my observations over the last year, uh, there's definitely a need for in another administrative position to help allocate um, the responsibilities of the state library. And so we're looking at offering or putting out a position for a deputy state librarian. We had that position um, maybe a decade ago and it went away and kind of was consolidated with some other positions. But in order to move forward, I think it's important that we have two people that can kind of guide the direction of different projects and different um, initiatives, as well as the, as I was talking about earlier, the requirements of being a state government entity. We have all those red tape type issues that we have to deal with as well as the um, the day-to-day -day executive order kind of things that we have to follow, like creating a continuity of operations plan that was uh, mandated last uh, a few months ago. So I think that's going to be important. And the other piece I would like to do, and uh, I'm talking with Alice, who I think is here in the meeting, um, is doing or developing a uh, kind of public library development position on top of separate from the PLS position and the uh, well, state data coordinator position and the LSTA position. So kind of building out that public library support. So we can look at new initiatives, new grant opportunities um, and kind of build more in that area. So there's those aspects. I'm also hoping that by adding some administrative support, we might reinvigorate programs like the Center for the Book. Um, I put a nice little picture in there about Kansas Reads Preschoolers that's coming up here in a little bit. Uh, so hopefully you're participating in that. Um, so there's those aspects. And then I would say also every once in a while we have a new program that we're working on. So right now the legislature, as part of the omnibus bill last session, developed the Kansas Blind Access Program, um, which essentially will fund a current news and periodical kind of database um, and access point for people in our Talking Books program. So we are working on implementing that at the moment. And then because it was only funded for one year, encouraged the legislature then to actually fund it moving forward and have a part-time staffing position to help support that program. So that's just a general overview. I mean, a lot of that stuff isn't that exciting, I would say, for you guys at the moment, but it's stuff that needs to be done so we can reposition ourselves to move forward. Um, we have the picture up here of Cali County. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of questions, some pieces of legislation, um, kind of rethinking about library taxing districts and other issues that we have from our statutes and regulations that are from the 60s that haven't really changed much 
despite the, the vast change we've had in the information landscape um, over the last few years. Um, but what I would say is we're looking at, well, are there updates that need to be made and involving a variety of stakeholders from the regional system directors to librarians, et cetera, to think through those changes. So we make wise decisions that people can agree and support for the most part. We've talked a little bit about the regional systems that you probably can't talk about the state library and the regional systems just because of the way they interoperate. Can you uh, let people know just like what is your relationship or communication with the seven regional systems and, and what that looks like uh, throughout the course of the year, I guess? Yeah, so the regional system directors meet monthly and I participate in those meetings. We also do have some extra meetings that are going on right now regarding what I just talked about with the regulations and some other topics that have come up of interest. Um, so kind of an opportunity for us to talk about from our different perspectives because every regional system is so different and how libraries utilize those systems are so different that if I try to make a change to regulation, I'm not seeing what, how that's gonna affect all the systems equally. And that's why I think having the input from the system directors is very helpful uh, to think through those changes and think through those questions that come up. And sometimes the answer is no, let's not change that because there's a good reason not to. But I think we've had some opportunities over the last year to say, well, why is it this way? Or there's this concern that's been ongoing for years and years and years. Is there a way we can resolve that? So. That's generally how, I mean, pretty much we work through um, those meetings. I communicate by email, obviously, and phone calls every once in a while with the system directors, but um, that's basically the main means is that those meetings. Ray, we appreciate you filling us in more about the state library. It's always interesting to hear about it, what's going on from that level. Uh, thank you, Anna. All right, folks, um, we will be again uh, back next month, and we don't know who that uh, guest will be. It might be you. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd be interested in talking about your library. It's a great way to get the word out about all the wonderful things you do. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you uh, maybe at KLA conference. And if not then, maybe online next month.